and water for my hike. Hi, did you know that you can survive about a month without food, but only five to seven days without fresh water? That's a pretty scary thought, especially if you're stranded in the desert. Today, we're going to look at the reasons why water is so important to human beings and why we shouldn't take water for granted. Hey, let's go. Hi, I'm in the far southwestern United States, near the Mexican border. And I'm trying not to break my neck. These caves are located near the Rio Grande River in Texas. Some parts of the year, they're only accessible by boat. So we're lucky to get here on foot. There they are, the Fate Bell Cave pictographs. 4,000 years ago, people used this cave as shelter, and without words or letters to communicate with, they drew pictures. In some of these caves near the Rio Grande River, you'll find drawings of people in canoes. You'll also find drawings of fish, which obviously they caught from the river and ate right here. There used to be an active waterway alongside these caves. Experts will tell you that ancient people built their communities along rivers and lakes for several reasons. First, there was plenty of food swimming in the water. There was also plenty of plants and animals to eat on the nearby land. Second, boats were a great way to travel and could carry heavy items like logs for building or other heavy cargo. It was much easier than dragging them across land. And third, the water itself. Water was something they needed to drink, to bathe in, and to play in. If they were ingenious, some even made it work for them. Think about where your drinking water comes from. Chances are there's a pump somewhere. And if it's drawing water from the ground, that's called groundwater. If you get your drinking water from a river or other body of water, that's called surface water. Presently, 44% of Americans get their drinking water from groundwater sources, and about 56% of Americans get their drinking water from surface water sources. People in New Orleans, the city near the mouth of the Mississippi River, drink water that comes from the river. The Mississippi is called Old Muddy because it's ground with the soil it carries from the shores of 31 states. The city spends about $6 million a year on water treatment. I am Richard Koch. I'm a water chemist. We are at the Carrollton Water Treatment Plant of the Sewerage and Water Board of New Orleans. Here we use a surface water source, the Mississippi River, to produce safe drinking water. The Mississippi River water is taken in at our intakes on the river as it enters, it's very muddy. It's very muddy. Immediately, we add ferric sulfate to it. That causes the particles within the Mississippi River water to come together to form large particles. The large particles settle to the bottom. The clearest water is skimmed off the top and sent down a passageway where chlorine is added to begin disinfection. A little later, ammonia is added that changes the chlorine to chloramine. This disinfection is continued through large contact basins. The water then goes to our filters and passes through the filters where small particles are removed. And the filtered water is then safe drinking water. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We perform 30,000 tests per year to ensure that this water is safe to drink. This water is collected in the clear well here and is then pumped out to the city of New Orleans we send out about 130 million gallons per day. We provide one of the essential ingredients of life. Water, we love you. The scenario is a little different in a place called Tiger, Georgia. It's a small community nestled in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Here, they're able to bottle cold mountain spring water after it's been filtered and treated with ozone. The water is then shipped and sold all over the country.
but even mountain water that looks clean could and often does have bacteria in it. So it needs to be treated before drinking. Think of all the ways you use water at home. For drinking. For showering or bathing. For washing cars. For pets. For growing plants. And for flushing. The average person in the U.S. uses 35 gallons of water each day just for flushing their toilets. 28 gallons of water for baths and showers. 18 gallons for washing clothes. 13 gallons for faucets. And 3 gallons for washing dishes. Totaling almost 100 gallons a person each day, not including water pistols. Tackle Box Brain Teaser. How much water do we have today compared to 3 billion years ago? A. More. B. Less. C. About the same. You can check the source of your water at home. Maybe you get it from a well tapping water directly from underground, or maybe from a shared water system. Maybe you have a water tower in your town, like this one. Have you ever wondered why someone would put water so far up in the air? Gravity pushes water through the system of underground pipes reaching homes throughout that town or city. When you think about it, that same gravitational pull can send you hurtling 25 miles an hour down a water slide. Models are a great way of showing you the key to tackling how water cycles all around us. Our first model shows two parts of the water cycle, precipitation and runoff. Precipitation is rain, snow, sleet, or any other way that water falls from the sky. And runoff is what happens when water hits the Earth's surface and runs off into rivers, lakes, streams, or other bodies of water. This second model shows another stage of the water cycle, groundwater. Infiltration and percolation explain how water penetrates the surface of the Earth and moves through the ground. If it were to rain here, this colored water shows infiltration and percolation. It seeps down to underground water storage zones called aquifers. Other stages of the water cycle are evaporation, condensation, and transpiration. Evaporation is when water changes from a liquid to a gas, like when water evaporates from a lake. Condensation is the change from gas back to water droplets, and transpiration is how nature returns moisture to the atmosphere through plant and animal respiration. Now those terms are so important to remember. Evaporation is when water changes from a liquid to a gas. Precipitation is rain, sleet, snow, or any other way that water falls from the sky. Runoff is what happens when water hits the Earth's surface and runs off into rivers, lakes, streams, or other bodies of water. Infiltration and percolation explain how water penetrates the surface of the Earth and moves through the ground. Condensation is the change from gas back to water droplets, and transpiration is how nature returns moisture to the atmosphere through plant and animal respiration. And the answer to the Tackle Box Brain Teaser is C, about the same amount of water as we had three billion years ago. Use of groundwater sources can drain the community supply of water. In some areas, it could take tens of thousands of years for rain to recharge or replace groundwater in the aquifers. You see, while the Earth's population is growing, our water supply is not. The recharge areas for many cities are located near their water aquifers, which can actually be far away from the city. Adequate recharge depends on precipitation and the demands for water by the population. Because available water supply is limited, the population it can support is also limited. This is an example of carrying capacity, the number of individuals that can best be supported by the resources available in a particular area. New York City has over 19 million people. The 8.5 million people in the city get their water from the Hudson River. 11 million people in surrounding areas get their water from surface lakes, surface streams, or from groundwater. Chicago has over 8 million people. The 5 million people living in the city get their water from the Great Lakes system. The remaining 3 million people in the suburbs get their water from surface lakes, surface streams, or from groundwater. Now this is an interesting one. Take a look at Los Angeles. LA is in such a dry climate that it draws far more water from the ground than the rainfall recharges. The 14.5 million people in and around Los Angeles depend on water sources 
like Faraway Mono Lake, the Central Valley Project, and the Colorado River. The Colorado, remember, is the mountain-splitting, gorge-forging force that carved the Grand Canyon. Ten major dams were built to harness the water and power of the Colorado. These dams produce 12 million kilowatts of power each year, and seven states, as well as parts of Mexico, get drinking water for over 20 million people. Not only is water supply and recharge important to a city, it's also important in the country for growing crops. And some crops depend on water even more than others. I'm Christy Pellerin, and I'm a rice farmer. Water is important to rice because of growth and also as a control method. Rice, unlike other crops such as soybeans and corn, can live through water because it has a special tissue which brings oxygen from the air down to its roots. Rice needs an average of anywhere from 30 to 40 inches of water per year. We also use water as a control method for a weed known as red rice. Rice production begins with the plowing of the land. Once we plow the land, we build up levees. That way we can contain water when we irrigate the fields. The irrigation of rice begins with pumping water from a well, which is at the corner of the field, down into a canal, which then brings the water into the fields. Once we have flooded the field, we then do a process called making mud, in which we use this equipment to level the land. That way when we plant the rice, they will all have the same amount of water on them. My favorite part of the process is making mud. The water we use is groundwater, which comes from an aquifer. We use the levees around the field, not only to hold the water in, but also to control the level of the water. Farmers conserve water by using Mother Nature. They use the rain that falls from the skies and they close up all their levees and their ditches. That way it holds the rainwater in. This reduces on the amount of water that the farmer has to pump into his field, which saves him money and saves the rest of the world precious water. Then we plant the rice by an airplane. Rice production, it really grows on the. We then release the flood and come in with the combine and harvest the rice, which is then sent to a mill where it's processed, packaged, and then sent to the consumers. I like rice production not only because I can be around grass and water, but also because I know that it sustains life for the rest of the world. Here's some catchy facts about fruits and vegetables. It takes 24 gallons of water to grow one pound of potatoes. It takes 65 gallons of water to grow one pound of oranges. And for one pound of watermelon, 5,214 gallons of water. So, if your town uses groundwater and you see a mall go up, maybe some offices, the buildings may not affect your water supply that much, but look out for the parking lots. Rain that falls on a parking lot cannot infiltrate, so the water recharge for the town may be disturbed. You may notice if more homes are built in your town, then the weaker the water pressure becomes. That's because so many people are drawing off the same aquifer. Now, here's a cool demo you can try. Get a bucket of water and fashion yourself a tiny water system. I have a thick tube here representing the city and I'm starting a siphon to represent using the water. Now I'm going to use this hose to represent recharging. While the people use water, nature recharges. I've got the town's new construction. We're talking three new neighborhoods and a shopping center. My hose symbolizes industry. shows that we continue to use the water from the system. Here, recharge is sufficient to meet the needs of the city. In our model, when the recharge is not sufficient, the water level in the bucket drops, and the flow may actually stop. Not too cool. Ask your teacher if you can try this with your class. About 70% of the world's water is used for agriculture. Holy mackerel. Mexico City is home to 27 million people, and part of the city is built on an old lake bed. 
The water recharge has not kept up with water use, and the city's aquifer is now depleted. This has caused some parts of the city to subside or settle nearly two feet a year. Looking, Looking at, at the, the earth, earth from, from out, out here, here it, it may, may seem, seem like, like there's, there's plenty of water, water for everyone, everyone. but 97% of the water, of the water is salty and, and not drinkable. Only 3% is freshwater, fresh water. and of that, that, only about 1% is percent not frozen. frozen. Icebergs and glaciers hold more than half the world's fresh water, leaving 1% for us. So we all share that limited quantity of the Earth's fresh water. That's why as babies are born, one every eight seconds in America, we need to consider the Earth's carrying capacity. Whether the Earth's water supply can carry or supply enough water for our population. You see, while the Earth's population is growing, the water supply is not. The Earth's water supply is about the same as it was back in the time of early civilizations. In fact, the quantity of water has not dramatically changed since the dinosaurs were here. So water you drink today could be from the same water sources dinosaurs drank from once upon a time. You can see on this graph that over the last 200 years, the Earth's population has dramatically increased. But remember, the world's water supply has remained about the same it hasn't increased with the population. Now, there are greater demands on fresh water than at any other time in history. Since water is so important, there are some things the Groundwater Foundation says that we can do to conserve and protect the water we so desperately need. For one thing, don't pollute. Dispose of chemicals properly and limit the amount of fertilizer you spread on the ground. Wash full loads of dishes or laundry. Check leaky faucets and have them fixed. Water outside only when necessary and don't waste water. And if you live in an area desperate for water, take short showers. Guess I'll check the carrying capacity of this boat now. Water, we can't live without it. Well, that about wraps up our show for now. But wait, did you know that a tomato's made up of 95% water? Each gallon of water weighs about eight pounds. Our bodies are made up of 75% water. It's all here. 18 gallons for washing clothes. <laughs> and three gallons for washing dishes. <laughs> Rain that falls on a parking lot. Parking lot? What? You may notice if more homes are built in your town, then the weaker the water pressure becomes. That's because so many people are. <laughs> that is her line. <laughs> to grow one pound of potatoes. Oh, that's good. Cool. And for one pound of watermelon? 500. Five thousand two. <laughs> Get a tiny leather, leather.